Yep, just started. Okay, okay. So please introduce yourself, sir. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a uh, sophomore at Harvard University, um, undergrad, um, studying history, I believe. I am undeclared at the moment, but probably studying history. So what exams did you give for admissions? Sorry? What exam did you take for admission? Uh, in I, took, I took the SAT. SAT, okay. So, does Harvard offer any scholarships? Sorry? Does Harvard offer any scholarships? Did you get any scholarship? Oh, um, so Harvard does um, need based financial aid. So, it will look at your family income and some other metrics and um, it does a pretty good job covering uh, most students who need extra financial aid, but they don't offer any scholarships for academics or um, extracurriculars or athletics. So um, I received some scholarships from other organizations like in my town and stuff. Um, like pretty small scholarships, but uh, they didn't offer any through the school. So why did you choose Harvard? Why did I choose Harvard? Yeah. Um, well, there was sort of a, you know, a number of things that I took into consideration. I think the biggest, um, the biggest factors for me were its location uh, in Boston, which is relatively close to home for me. Um, the, the academic, um, sort of flexibility to study what I wanted when I wanted, um, was really big, um, and sort of being able to try out a bunch of different things before I choose what I want to study. Um, as well as of course, just being, um, such a good school and, uh, opening up a lot of opportunities for me, depending on what I wanted to do, uh, with my life. So it was sort of just those things. Yeah. So what, what are your school's strengths? Like what Harvard is known for? Sorry? What, what, are, the, what are your school's strengths? Like what it is good for? Like engineering or like history? Like what subject is it good for? What is Harvard good for? Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's a number of things. It's relatively good at, um, I think tough to say. Uh, they have a pretty strong engineering program. The computer science program is quite popular and strong. Um, there's a decent amount of people who I think um, go into continue their, their kind of journey in academia coming out of Harvard um, and, and, and go into that, um, especially in the humanities area of things. Um, and then I think the school can be a pipeline to working in finance or consulting, um, the sorts of things where you can go through Harvard major in something in the social sciences, um, and it opens up a lot of doors for um, jobs that are related to business and, and finance and stuff. So, what is your number one complaint about your school? Number one complaint? Yeah. Um, I don't... No, I mean, I think there are a couple things that Harvard can improve upon. Um, some simple things like uh, a lot of students complain about the food. I think the food is uh, just fine. It's not amazing, but it's also, um, I mean, I think it's quite good um, for the most part. And then I think um, something that you run into with most universities is that their transparency and policymaking um, and you know other things that affect students is not super transparent so um if they're making rules around handling um you know academic violations or, or student life issues uh often students are not giving direct input into the way the university handles things and so um that sort of lack of say and that lack of transparency can be frustrating at times it's not unique to harvard um but i think it's something that uh, I've run into a couple times. So, are you happy at Harvard? How's your experience so far? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously with coronavirus, I've been um, sort of sidetracked um, from, you know, my on-campus experience. But I think in terms of classes, I've certainly been uh, challenged without feeling extremely stressed. Um, in comparison to high school, I feel that there's much more of a focus on growth and uh, sort of self-motivated, like, intellectual uh, growth and, and discovery, uh, rather than just like getting the grade and getting things done. Um, and in terms of the campus life, I found it to be difficult to navigate at first. Um, but then sort of, I settled in with friends, I settled in with extracurriculars and it, before I got sent home for coronavirus, it was, uh, it was great. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the, the Harvard experience. And now that it's online, the classes are still really interesting to me and, and I feel that I'm getting a lot out of them, but obviously I'm severed from um, what would be a, a better experience with friends and, and in-person learning. Glad to know you are enjoying your on online classes. So if you could change one thing about Harvard, what would it be? Hmm. I think one thing that I, I knew going into Harvard, but I don't think I understood the degree to which it might affect what I am doing is that it's not a pre-professional school. So a lot of other schools will, for example, offer you, um, I ran into this in two places. Uh, one, when I was thinking about teaching, um, Harvard doesn't, unlike a lot of schools, doesn't offer a path to get your teaching certification. Um, at least it's not an easy path. You could kind of work within Harvard to get a, a certification to teach right out of undergraduate, um, but they don't make it very easy and they don't encourage it. Um, and then their architecture major uh, is under history of art and architecture. And it doesn't, the, if you follow the major alone, uh, the architecture major to its end and you graduate as an architecture major, you aren't actually set up to be accepted into graduate school for architecture. Um, you would have to take other courses so they don't, they're not very pre-professional. Uh, if you want to set yourself up to be certified into a profession right out of school, uh, you have to make sure that you're covering those bases on your own uh, because the school doesn't make it super easy for you. Um, and that's sort of something that I would like to see changed. I would like to see a little bit more of a culture where you can have all the intellectual exploration that Harvard offers, but you also are able to get a teaching certificate if you want. You're able to set yourself up for architecture school or for um, you know a different graduate school that uh, you actually have the skills to do it. Um, so that's something that makes Harvard unique and it makes it a great place, but also you're sacrificing some, uh, some mobility, I guess. I, th I think this is a good suggestion and Harvard should listen to it. <laughs> Thank you. So next Thanks. How accessible are administrators, registers, and financial aid officers at the... Um, yeah, in terms of access to everybody, I think um, I've heard in my own experience and, and talking with others, I think the, the, the financial aid administrators and um, people who are really directly involved with, with student life are really, they do make every effort to be accessible. Um, and you have such a really robust support system on campus, uh, with, as a first year, you have not only like, um, your, your academic advisor, your sort of residential advisor, uh, but you have like a peer advisor and you have, um, you know, various other people who are there to support you. And then as you continue on, you have an academic and a residential advisor. Um, as well as various people in the, the housing system at Harvard, which is a really unique um, like house system. You have people there who are just around to support you. So you have a really robust support system. Uh, when you start looking at the higher levels of administration, like I have a complaint about you know the way the university is run, I need to talk to the president of the university. They're not very accessible and they, they make a pretty strong effort to not be accessible. Um, because Harvard is, you know, it's a private institution. It's not, um, it's not super interested in, uh, at the higher levels, it's not super interested in hearing student voices, um, which is, again, like I said, not unique to Harvard, but certainly something that you run into. 
Yeah. So who believes you can succeed at school? Sorry? Who believes you can succeed? In? Like who believes in you? Is there someone like teacher, some teacher or like some TA, teaching assistant, like who believes in you? Like this guy is going to be the next big thing like that. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, I think there's been such a like grouping of people who have uh, believed in me and, and, and sort of pushed me to do better. I think um, my family has always been really supportive, um, sort of even when I was not looking at like Harvard as an option for me, they were like, keep that door open, um, don't undersell yourself. And then um, I've had a couple of teachers in high school who um, inspired me to think bigger and then since getting to Harvard, I think the people who have really um, pushed me to be better and have encouraged me in my academic journey have mostly been um, teaching assistants uh, who know me a little bit better because we are in, um, we have a lot of courses where you have a lecture and then you have a discussion section with 10-ish people and a teaching assistant. Uh, and those TAs are usually the biggest support support for me at least uh because they kind of get to know you as a student and i've had a couple who i really love who have you know pushed me to say hey like what if you thought uh broadly speaking they've just pushed me to think about other possibilities for myself not only in the class and like the way i'm approaching the intellectual <laughs> stuff in the class but also in terms of what there is out there for me to do because i'm still not sure what i want to do with my career and stuff um but they have been good at giving me insight to that. So mostly TAs at Harvard have been influential. TAs take care of students because they can interact with students easily. Like a professor have to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like he has to manage full class and do his work. So like, so what is your contribution to the school? What have I contributed? Uh, what have you contributed to the Harvard so far? Ooh. Good question. Um, not too much um, in terms of, you know, I'm not published. I'm not, um, I haven't won any awards or anything like that um, as I'm not really involved in many competitive extracurriculars. I'd like to think I've done some decent uh, like community building and stuff. Um, I'm part of the running club, which is, uh, you know, a club sport. Um, and I think we've done we've done a lot in the past year of not only kind of expanding um our club but also making um making new rules and regulations within the club that are aimed at making it more accessible to everybody um and we're trying to promote that as something that other clubs should do um so it's these sort of i haven't been directly involved in a lot of academic achievements yet knock on wood i i will be um but I've been trying to contribute to, to student life as well, and like, especially pushes for inclusion in student life and um, uh, and making it a safer campus for people has been where I've focused a lot of my energy as a first year. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what I've contributed so far. That's a good thing, making school safer. So what happens in the school that makes you afraid or frustrated or defeated? Is there something happens at the school? something in the school that makes me afraid, frustrated, or defeated? Yeah. Um, I think there are times, um, and I'm sure this is the case for many students at many schools, um, there are times when uh, imposter syndrome can really hit, um, where you feel that you don't belong there for any number of reasons. Um, you know, everybody got into Harvard. Um, everybody deserves to be there, but there's often this feeling like somewhere in you that you don't deserve to be there and that you're not good enough. Um, whether it's just like you get a bad grade on a test or you, um, you know, you're in class and everybody knows what's going on and you're lost completely. Um, and I've had, a, I had a lot of those moments freshman year of like, do I belong here? Um, and it's something that I think everybody deals with and I, I hope it goes away. Like, I hope it'll get easier over time. But I've even talked to seniors who are like, I still feel like I might not belong here because I feel that the work I'm doing is not on par with my classmates. So that's something that, that I think is 
almost universal at these, um, like, I know it happens to other uh, students at Ivy League schools, um, but it's also, like, extremely difficult to deal with. So, um, yeah, imposter syndrome. Don't worry, you will catch up. Sorry? You will catch up. Sometimes you will know that other students know things where teachers are teachers on the blackboard and you don't know. So you will catch up soon. Don't worry about this. So when do you feel challenged and supported? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. When do you feel challenged and supported? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so when do I feel challenged? Um, I think there are, I, I mean, I think there's, I've taken classes knowing they're going to be challenging. I think one of the things that Harvard, uh, the culture of Harvard is such that you know when you're going to be in a difficult class and you know when you're going to be in a class that's maybe a little bit easier. Um, and so I felt the most challenged um, in sort of STEM classes, in um, uh, especially like I've taken some data science classes that are relatively challenging. Um, and then there's also this, sometimes you walk into a class and everybody's nodding along and nobody actually knows what's going on because the professor is moving at like a million miles an hour. Um, but you just feel like completely lost. And I think that's like, it happened a lot in philosophy, but yeah, um, STEM classes are definitely challenging for me. Um, yeah. So what inspires you in that school? Um, one of the most inspiring things about Harvard has been being surrounded by people who are, um, who are, are really really intelligent and, and have really interesting things going on in their lives, uh, whether they're academic interests or things they do on the side. Um, and so you'll get this, you have this community around you of people. And so you could be at the dining hall getting a, a meal and you could strike up conversation with somebody who you either know a little bit or you've never met before um, and learn just like something amazing that you didn't know before. And, and being constantly surrounded by people who challenge you and inspire you and, and have something to say is really like it's like beyond it's beyond inspiring it's so like invigorating and it it makes me more academically uh inclined to like work hard um it, it makes me more creative and it's like it's very much something i miss about being on campus frankly um that sort of spontaneity so who helps you buy back from setbacks. Yeah. Um, who helps me bounce back? Yeah, in the school. Like, yeah. If you have setback, like, you know, school good grades or something like that, like, who would help you? So I think um, I have not leaned too heavily on the support network that they set up for you uh, in terms of residential advisors and academic advisors. Um, but the knowledge that they're there is very comforting. And I know people who have use them to bounce back from uh, difficulties and have found them to be very uh, knowledgeable. Usually they are either PhD candidates or, um, or uh, adults of some sort, usually teaching. Um, sometimes they're like researchers at the college, but um, they, they give you some perspective. They can help you talk to your teachers if you're having setbacks. Um, I found that uh, usually it's like upperclassmen who uh, I just know through running club or some other extracurricular. And if I'm having a tough time and I like talk to them, they can usually give me some perspective, which usually amounts to saying, hey man, like one bad grade isn't gonna tank your entire career. You're gonna be fine. Um, which is honestly all I've needed. Uh, I know other people have struggled with some deeper issues of mental health and stuff. And they've usually been able to navigate that with the support network that the that the school puts in place for you um and I, I was grateful to have that network and i love uh my academic advisors i just haven't used them yet uh knock on wood i won't have to hopefully i won't bomb any classes but uh you know right now i'm, I'm, I'm sitting pretty so uh but yeah so if i ask your friends to describe you what would they say Ooh. Um, 
what would they say? Um, I think uh, I give off a little bit of a, a goofy vibe. Uh, I'm a little bit... Uh, I try not to take things too seriously generally, um, although I am very passionate about um, about certain things and I will take those seriously. Um, I'd like to think they describe me as uh, kind. I do try to be kind, which is, you know, low-hanging fruit, but uh, is something that I, I do try to project. I try to project sort of um, and practice, uh, like, empathy and uh, kindness and trying to be open because I think at Harvard there's a lot of um, snap judgments that sometimes happen. Um, a lot of people are coming from different places and different understandings of what it means to be at school. I think some people are there more to... Uh, move forward and, and get ahead, um, which is, of course, part of the reason I'm there, but I think that doesn't have to be at the expense of others. And so that's sort of, um, I believe, you know, pretty firmly in, like, collaboration, being welcoming, uh, not taking it too seriously, um, and, and sort of trying to, yeah. So that's sort of, I don't know, those are things that I hope they would say about me. Yeah. They'd probably also say that I'm okay. a little bit of a know-it-all. Um, but, yeah. What subject do you enjoy the most and why? Yeah, um, the subject, sorry, did you say something at the can end? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, you broke up for a no. second, but um, the subject I enjoy the most and why, right? That was the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm currently uh, a probable history major. Uh, I don't have to declare until later this year. Uh, what I'm majoring in, but um, obviously I like history. In terms of like the actual class that's been probably the best class for me, um, I've really enjoyed um, two classes. I took one class about education in, uh, in America, the systems of education, um, and that was a really interesting course, not only because it was taught really well, because it was taught by a bunch of people who study education, so they were obviously really good at educating, um, but also because it was sort of my first introduction to wrestling with a bunch of really big questions in America of, uh, you know, questions of, um, belonging and, and public good and what it means to, uh, you know, produce public goods and, and what, what's intrinsic to our society. Um, and then my other really great course that I took was, um, called History of American Populisms, and that was... Uh, just a history course that was taught very well. Um, it was taught by a professor who made, you know, every, he took every opportunity he could to connect with students and also to um, push us to do more without stressing us out. So he was, all, he was constantly saying like, yeah, if that interests you, go research it. Um, but he wasn't pressuring us to do groundbreaking research all the time. Uh, it was more like this sort of, casual um casual fostering of an of an intellectual community at least that's how i felt in that class um so those were my two favorite classes that i've taken so what class do you like the least and why um so you know all the classes that i took uh online were difficult to sort of stick like get through uh when we transitioned online the first time um in spring semester uh, my teachers just weren't super ready to do that. Um, so they all sort of, you know, had uh, had issues with that. But in terms of the actual content, um, I was challenged quite a bit in my philosophy course, but I thought it was taught quite well. Um, I took the, a course called Philosophy of Law. And then I think I had, I probably did not, my, my least favorite course was, sorry. Philosophy of Law, what is the course name? Philosophy course of Law. Course name. Uh, it, it would be Phil okay. Eleven, is the name of it. Sorry. Oh, you broke up there. Okay. Okay, um, okay yeah. I can hear you on you just carry on, please. Uh, okay, cool. Um, the class. So, uh, do you want me to say the class? I my least favorite class, I guess. Yeah. Say. Yes. Yeah, say. 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 Yeah. Say. So I, I. I personally did not enjoy. Um, my intro economics class, although that's no fault of the professors, like they, 
they were some of the best professors I've had. Um, it just wasn't as, as a student, the, the like economics didn't exactly resonate with me. It wasn't my favorite way of, of thinking and stuff. So that was probably my least favorite course, but the actual course itself, uh, for anybody who's interested in economics, I'm sure would be excellent. Um, the teachers are very, very well qualified and they work really hard to make it a good experience. So, yeah, history and economics are two different areas of studies. So, maybe yeah. that is why you did not design. Yeah, so you just wanted to make sure we are recording this chat, right? Sorry, we are recording this chat, right? I'm making sure again, okay, that okay, I'm recording separately. So, so, but let me find a question. Were you able to take most of your first choice classes at Harvard? Sorry, uh, can you just give me one second? I need to let my dog out. Chester. Okay. Go on, buddy. All right. Cool. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Were you able to take most of your first choice classes? How is your is difficult? Is it to enroll in the classes you want, want to? Yeah, um, I managed, so far, I've managed to take the classes I want at Harvard. Um, I think they make it relatively easy to take pretty much everything you want to. There's a couple of small classes where um, you're lottery, uh, you're like lotteried into the class. Um, and I know people who have lotteried for the same class multiple years. And if you do, you know, if you want to get into one class and you lottery for it every year, um, by senior year, they're going to find a way to get you into that class. Um, but it, it could take a while. Um, so there's a couple of like high demand classes, but for the most part, you can take what you want at Harvard. Um, the, the, usually the worst case scenario is, um, you have to email a professor and say, Hey, can you please let me into your class? And they'll usually let you into the class, even if it's, uh, you know, one above capacity. That's nice. So... Do your professors hold office hours and will they meet you outside of the class? Yeah, the the professors do, um, to varying degrees, make themselves uh, accessible. They all hold office hours. Um, there's definitely, you can tell when professors are interested in making connections with students and when they're a little bit less interested. Um, so you'll, def you'll have professors who hold office hours and then say, if these times don't work, uh, just send me an email and we'll meet some other time. Uh, and then you get professors who are like, I have one hour on a Monday night and, you know, you can come then. And if you can't make it, they, 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 they're always going to make yeah. themselves accessible if you pressure them. Um, if you're like, hey, I really need to meet. But you can definitely get a sense of when a professor really wants to meet with you and when a professor is more focused on their research. Um, but I have had for like based on my slate of classes, almost all of my professors have been bending over backwards to meet with us, to get to know us, uh, to, to help us in any way, or to, you know, just chat with us. Um, and I think that usually is the case. The vast majority of Harvard professors, I think, do want to engage with undergrads because I think it's part of what makes the job fun, interesting, etc. So are professors available for research with undergraduate students? Yeah, so there's sort of um, various paths to research at Harvard. Um, you know, they have some programs uh, where you can apply and it's more of a mentorship um, relationship where you're doing research and you're, um, you're sort of learning and building sort of an academic partnership. Uh, and that's what I applied for this year. It's called the Radcliffe Research Partnership is one example of those. Uh, I think there's a summer program as well. Um, so that's one path is to apply for one of the research programs. Another path is to just kind of reach out to professors uh, and say, hey, I want to do research. Um, and, you know, you can find a research uh, gig relatively easily. I mean, I sort of stumbled upon one my freshman year um, and it wasn't for me. Um, it was actually research with somebody from University of Massachusetts, um, but it was through somebody I knew from Harvard who got me the job. And uh, I ended up quitting that job um, just because it wasn't, um, 
it was a lot of work and I wasn't getting too much out of it. Um, but they're relatively prevalent. There's a lot of jobs. Uh, there, there's a lot of research opportunities if you are willing to reach out and to ask professors for research opportunities. They can usually look for one for you. Uh, I, I just know plenty of people who are doing research. So it's, a, it's an option for sure. Okay. So are your classes lecture-based or discussion-based? So it's a, it's usually a mix. I think now that we're online, um, a lot of professors are making a really concerted effort to add more discussion. Um, but the, I would say the majority of courses you take freshman and sophomore year are lectures uh, with a lot of people and they just lecture and then you have a discussion with your um, teaching assistant um, in a small group later in the week, usually. Um, and so you get big lecture and a little discussion. Um, and then as you progress, you get a lot more, you get smaller and smaller classes um, within your major, um, small seminar classes, small just thesis research classes, where you're just with like anywhere from, you know, 15 to three people, um, depending on the concept, uh, depending on the major. And, um, but yeah, I would say early on, it's mostly lectures. Okay, mostly like this. So how satisfied are you with academic advising? Yeah, I think um, my academic advisor my freshman year was quite good at um, what he was doing. He was also my residential advisor, so he was, he was actually both. Um, but he was a Harvard uh, alum. He went there for undergrad, and I think that tends to be the case with academic advisors. Um, they are usually they went to Harvard undergrad, so they know their way around. Um, my academic advisor this this year is like new. Um, you get a new one starting sophomore year. Uh, and then you also will get a concentration advisor once you're in a concentration, sorry, a major. Um, we call them concentrations, it's not useful. Um, but um, anyway, that's just a long way of saying, I don't know my ac academic advisor too much right now, but uh, the one meeting I've had with her has been great. and. Um, I've been pretty pleased with it, although I haven't relied on it as much as some students. Uh, you did not, you did, haven't needed academic advisors. Okay, so what was your freshman experience like? Um, yeah, I mean, I think my pre-COVID freshman experience was pretty good. I think um, as with most people going to school, that first month is a little bit difficult because you're trying to figure out not only what you want to do academically and with extracurriculars, but you're also trying to figure out uh, friends and like who your friends might be. Um, and there seems to be at the very beginning, there's sort of a rush to know what you're doing in all those areas. Um, but yeah, I think I, I pretty much settled in. I, I think the best advice I would give to somebody who's like a freshman is to uh, start slow and ramp it up. So start with like one extracurricular activity even if like i don't know in high school i did like five academic er, extracurriculars um that took a lot of time and when i got to harvard i purposely scaled back i started slow i did like one thing and then you know next semester if you're doing well you can add a couple things and the same thing with friends like make a good friend, make a couple good friends and then you'll your social circle will expand you don't have to go and like find friends uh, start slow and then kind of scale it up. And I think that's what worked for me pretty well. Um, I was in no hurry to like get everything figured out and it worked. Uh, yeah. What did you typical day like? How was, what was your typical pre-COVID day like? Um, sorry. What did you a typical, typical day? Like how do you start your day at Harvard? Yeah, um, so my typical day at Harvard would be, um, I mean, I, I had a bunch of 9 a.m. classes, which is the earliest class you can get, so um, it wasn't too bad. I would, I would wake up, go to the dining hall. Uh, a lot of people skip breakfast. I never skip breakfast. Um, I would, uh, yeah, and then I would have, usually I would have classes pretty much until, depending on the day, it was usually no later than... Um, like 2.30 um, or I guess 2.45. And then I would spend the afternoon, I would go to running club 
and then I would spend the afternoon and night doing homework. Um, you know, I would go to dinner, obviously. I would go to lunch. Um, but I would spend a, a good chunk of the afternoon and night consumed by schoolwork. Uh, there wasn't a lot of weeknight shenanigans that I got into because I was, I was usually working uh, for a couple hours. Um, I mean, not a couple, probably like five hours every night, more or less. Um, yeah, that was sort of, that would be the average day. Uh, a lot of reading and a lot of, uh, you know, enjoying my meal times immensely. Uh, yeah. So how much time do students need studying per day? Yeah, it's going to depend on the classes and the student. Um, I would say, like I said, I think I took maybe four to five hours of every day to be doing some combination of studying, actually like doing uh, problem sets or whatever, writing an essay. Um, and then on the weekends, I would usually spend eight hours a day um, working on stuff. So that was sort of my workflow, but I was taking a lot of... Um, some of the, some classes that at least for me were easier, um, they were not, I wasn't taking a lot of, uh, you know, engineering classes or math classes that would have taken me more time. Uh, and I was also only taking four classes uh, and I've always taken four classes, but some students take five and work much longer than I worked. So it's gonna depend on your classes that you choose. So what is your favorite place to study at campus? What was my favorite place? Yeah, to study. Yeah. Um, I had a couple places. My favorite place was this tiny um, reading room in a music library uh, that nobody really knew about. Uh, and it's this beautiful, it's like furnished like a, like a, a colonial like living room. Like it's very like um, kind of old, and kind of ornate, but not like, it was. It felt kind of homey in a, in a way, and um, and they have like nice uh, sunlight uh, coming through and stuff, and it's a beautiful little place to study. Um, I also liked to go. There's a sort of a uh, library hybrid space called the Smith Campus Center, uh, and I like to study there because it's open to the broader community, and so you get a lot of people. You get like working professionals. You get uh, unhoused people who are just like stopping there for you know, a, a place to be warm during the day. And so it's sort of this like broader group of people. So it breaks the Harvard bubble a little bit. You're not, you don't feel like you're stuck in this like intense environment because there's so many people from so many different walks of life there. So those were my two favorite places to study. Yeah. So what do you do when you are not in class? Yeah. Um, when I'm not in class, I, let's see, plenty of, uh, you know, hanging out with friends and stuff was big. Um, just, you know, uh, going to parties and that sort of stuff. Uh, running club, like I said, was my extracurricular that was really big. Um, you know, I would practice every day. We had social events. Uh, and I got involved in some activism on campus as well. Um, namely, sort of uh, a, a group of undergraduates who was fighting for uh, like labor justice, uh, labor rights, and then a group of undergraduates that was fighting um, for sort of better, um, it was called, uh, yeah, it was about addressing sexual violence on campus. So those were my sort of activist orgs, as well as an environmental activist organization that I got involved in. So uh, those are what I was doing while not in class. So what do you do on the weekends? Um, sleep, study, and, uh, and I guess, you know, sometimes go out. Uh, I was not like a partier and it's not really a party school. Um, so occasionally, you know, you go out with friends. Um, but I, I really reserve my weekends for sleeping and, and working. Um, I tended to like sort of spreading out. Uh, uh, some people did want to just like have the weekend where it's like, woo, it's the weekend. I'm not doing stuff. They would go off campus and go on some trip. Um, I tended to keep it a little bit more focused because I found that that worked better for me. If I took a lot of time away from working, I would then be more stressed. So, um, but catching up on sleep was a big thing during the weekends for me personally. Everybody needs to, 
six or eight hours of sleep, right? Yes, indeed. To stay, yeah. So, what students do not fit in Harvard? Um, I think it can feel like there's a sort of a Harvard student. Um, it can feel like, you know, uh, you have to be sort of an, uh, a really, I felt that, that a lot of my classmates were really good at like networking and, um, and sort of that skill. And, and I think that's not necessarily true. I think there's such a broad, uh, group of people at Harvard that, um, you're going to pretty much fit in. I think the, the one thing that you wouldn't want to do at Harvard is, um, show up with an overly competitive mindset. Um, or a mindset that you're there just for yourself because while there are some people that you come across that are there just for themselves and are just trying to get ahead um, they're not extremely well liked and um, and I think you're gonna have a tough time being happy for four years if you're not willing to just like make real friendships and um, you know and, and be flexible and stuff so if you show up thinking I'm gonna do XYZ I'm gonna get out of here um, that's not, you're not going to fit in. Um, but if you show up any other walk of life, like I think there's a, a pretty much a niche for you at Harvard. So would it be possible for a freshman to start his own student organization? If yes, what is the process like? Um, oh, like, so starting your own student org? Student organization at Harvard. Yeah. When is freshman start here? So I, um, I don't know the exact process for starting a student organization. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I know f that they are, there are a lot of them and I think they're relatively easy to start. I think, um, you can, there's, there's definitely no like barrier. If you want to do something, you can do it. Um, and you can find space to do it. Uh, you can book a room for pretty much anything at Harvard. Um, in terms of actually getting funds from the university for your activity, I'm not sure exactly what the process is, but I know that like a lot of clubs get funds that you would you might expect not. Like I mean, we have like an esports team, which I think is excellent, but also is a little bit off the beaten path, and they get funds from the UC. So I'm not. I think it's relatively easy to get funds from the from the university to do your activity, um, and anybody can start anything. Um, yeah. So. What kind of things are there to do in your school's hometown? Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're, at, you're in Harvard, so um, you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is right next to Boston. So you get everything that Cambridge has to offer in terms of um, it's sort of this nice, it's more residential and it's more, uh, there's some shopping, there's some uh, kind of nice parks and stuff. And then... In Boston, you get all the all the cultural stuff of Boston. So there's theater, there's um, sports, uh, there's you know Fenway Park is right there for for the Red Sox, um, and uh, there's a bunch of there's a lot of untapped activities to do in Boston in terms of if you want to get involved in organizations that are you know fighting homelessness or something like that, you um, you can do it because Boston is right there and there's so many people who are headquartered in Boston. Um, sorry, my dog keeps coming in and out. Um, but, but there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in Boston to do. Um, and a lot of opportunities just around there for anything you want to do that's not offered through the university. I'm sure there's a way to find it in Boston. So, you want to let your dog in? Yeah, he's let he, him in. Yeah, he's in. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's his name? Uh, his name is Chester. He's Chester. a he's a nice to to Chester. So, where do students tend to hang out on or off campus? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of hangout spots. I think. Um, yeah, the for freshmen the dining hall is such a sort of hub of, of social interaction because it's all the freshmen eat at the dining hall and they're all living in harvard yard so there's a lot of centralized uh you know social contact because everybody's living in the same place when you 
when you're no longer a freshman, you live um, in your house. So that tends to be a center of social interaction, but you're mostly interacting with people from your house. Um, and then on the weekends, there's not, um, like in terms of like party spots and stuff, there's not a lot of that at Harvard. Um, like physical space is kind of few and far between because it's a lot of old, uh, old buildings that were not built for uh, ragers. So you have, um, you know, there are some dorm, there's, there's a lot of like dorm parties that go on that are very cramped. Um, but I, I would say hanging out in the dining hall is like a really big thing for freshmen, especially. So is it easy to get around campus or get off campus without a car? Yeah, so um, you can pretty much get, you know, all around Boston using the uh, subway system. Uh, the MBTA, and you can also actually get out to the suburbs um, using their commuter rail system, although that's a little bit harder. Um, and Cambridge is very walkable. You can pretty much walk to wherever you need to go uh, in terms of buying uh, groceries or, or, you know. Um, and then there are some student orgs that will, uh, they'll organize, for example, the Outing Club or the Mountaineering Club will organize trips farther off campus, like up to New Hampshire, uh, and they'll rent cars uh, and pay for them with the, the organization's funds. So um, it's relatively easy to get around without a car. I mean, I, nobody has a car on campus. So uh, some people have bikes, but for the most part, you can just get around using buses, trains, um, and, uh, and feet. Okay. So is it a safe area to walk around at night? What kind of safety measures are in place? Yeah, so we have, um, like most schools, we have a blue light system, which um, has these sort of little, they almost look like phone booths, and they have a blue light, um, and if you, and there are every, like, I guess you would call it, like, maybe a city block, like, they're, they're very, you can always see one from the other, and they're all over campus, so if you're ever feeling unsafe, you could just, like, tap the blue light, and the university police department will show up. Um, it's... Cambridge is like a very safe place. Um, sometimes people who are visiting think it's less safe because we have um, a pretty large uh, unhoused population uh, of people who are currently uh, living without homes. But um, part of the reason they're there is because um, they're not dangerous. Like they're, they're just um, don't have houses at the moment and they are uh, living in Cambridge because it's safe for them as it is safe for us. Um, so very very rarely does any uh are there any incidents of like actual danger in cambridge uh you can walk around at night usually you want a buddy just to be safe um you know you don't want to walk alone at night for the most part um but it's not it's it's one of the safer spots in boston and i uh in the boston area and um you know the 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 appearance of uh there's a lot, like, there's a very public presence of unhoused people, uh, but they're, they're not any safety threat. Like, they're very much just members of the community, so. Yeah. So what kind of housing choices are there? Housing choices? Yeah. Um, Do yeah, so you, freshman year, you're sorted into a freshman dorm, um, and you just kind of live there. Uh, and it's all on the yard, which is pretty great. So you're all really close to each other. Uh, and then you're sorted randomly into a house. Uh, there are 12 houses. Um, and you live there for the next three years. You can live off campus in, uh, if you want, but there's very little, I think there's a requirement that you live on campus for two years. Um, and there's also very much a culture of living on campus, um, living in your house. Um, and enjoying that experience. So most people don't live off campus. Uh, it's almost all, it's very much a residential college. Like you very much, you live there. Um, the dorms are all pretty nice. Uh, they vary in quality sometimes, but for the most part, you're, you're safe, you're warm, you're pretty happy. Um, and then there's also the, the Dudley Co-op, which is a cooperational living uh, like house that you can be in. Uh, and that's kind of the only big off-campus option. Uh, but that's about 20 students, so. So, how are the resident counselors 
Do they plan social events for freshmen to get to know, get to know each other? Yeah, the the social like the programming and and the social events for freshmen and even upperclassmen are pretty like robust. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a I think there is a group of students at Harvard that's relatively sizable that um, is not super comfortable, uh, you know, socializing with like going to parties or like going around and, and just kind of like socializing broadly. So they set up these events so that everybody is included. Um, and for freshmen, that means usually they have like this whole slew of events at the beginning of the fall semester for freshmen that are just about meeting other freshmen, getting to know them. Um, and then they have like, um, a, a ton of social events throughout the year that are really, really nice. Um, for example, in the winter, they'll set up, um, they'll have fires on the um, Science Center Plaza. There's sort of this plaza and they'll light fires and you can go and buy um, s'mores stuff and like roast s'mores over the fire. Like it's it's very nice that the stuff they set up for students to get to know each other. So how prevalent are drugs and alcohol at, at on campus? Yeah, I think, um, like any college campus, uh, there's, you know, use of drugs and alcohol. Um, one of the things that's nice about Harvard is that there's not a lot of drugs. Um, it's mostly it's alcohol use. Um, and there's never, at least I've never witnessed any pressure to drink, um, at any social event. Um, a lot of clubs have very consciously have, uh, social events where it's clear there's going to be drinking, uh, they'll have a party or whatever, but they'll also purposefully have social events where there's not going to be drinking. Um, and so it's compared to other universities, I think it's really accessible for students who do want to drink or who don't want to drink. Um, and for the most part, uh, we don't have problems with binge drinking or, you know, over, over drinking. Uh, it does happen freshman fall a lot of people uh will get will will have trouble with that but there's not a lot of pressure to do it so that's good that's good thing i guess yeah so what are some of the most popular extracurricular activities and why yeah i think um you know a lot of people are involved in club sports a lot of people are involved in uh cultural affinity organizations so um you know, uh, Asian American uh, social group, um, you know, Black Student Union, uh, those sorts of affinity groups. Um, there's a significant amount of people who write for uh, either the Crimson or a different journal, uh, Harvard Political Review. Uh, so a lot of student writers. And then there are a couple of like pretty professional organizations. Um, one of the, uh, there's, HSA, which is Harvard Student Agencies, which is uh, a student-owned company that does a bunch of things around Harvard. And there's also HCCG, which is Harvard College Consulting Group. And they're relatively popular. Uh, they get a lot of applications. I don't think they're a very big organization, but there are a lot of students who are eager to join. So. The last question. What are some of the most popular Harvard traditions? Yeah, we, we've got a, a, a fair slew of traditions. Um, I think the, the ones you'll hear about are uh, the Primal Scream is pretty famous. Um, that's on the last night before finals, I believe. Um, every semester, the A, a group of the student body uh, strips naked and runs around Harvard Yard um, at midnight. <laughs> So that's a that's an interesting tradition, um, a little bit explicit, but uh, <laughs> fun anyway. Um, and then I think there's uh, there's you know other things that are like bandied about as traditions um, that are never really completed that I'd rather not uh, discuss in the YouTube video. But you'll hear them when you get to uh, when you get to college. There's sort of like there's sort of like these like oh it's the Harvard tradition, but there's never really like. Like I said, there's not a lot of pressure to do things that would make you uncomfortable at Harvard uh, in terms of like social stuff. So, you know, nobody's nobody's forcing you to jump off Weeks Bridge uh, into the Charles River, even though that's one of the things that they say you should do at Harvard. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the Primal Scream is pretty well known and is uh, a very interesting Harvard tradition. Um, yeah. <laughs> So do you have one message for high school students who want to apply for Harvard? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that was difficult for me in applying to Harvard was feeling feeling a ton of pressure uh, in the lead up to applying to like be the best that I can be and to present myself really well. And I think that's good to have. Like having